So without further ado, uh, let me uh, introduce our speakers. So first off, we've got Saeed Amidi, who's the CEO and founder of Plug and Play, which is the world's largest innovation platform, bringing together the best startups, corporations, and investors to scale and accelerate new technologies. Um, he's a serial entrepreneur and a seasoned executive with nearly 30 years experience founding and growing successful companies across four continents. Said is also one of Silicon Valley's most successful venture capitalists. He's investing in over 250 startups per year with Notable exits, which include PayPal, Dropbox, Lending Club, and most recently Honey, which was in turn acquired by PayPal for $4 billion. Saeed's a global thought leader and a champion of open innovation with a real passion for inspiring and helping entrepreneurs and corporations bring about sustainable futures. Saeed, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. It's great being with you. I am unable to start my video, but I'm sure it will be fixed soon. No worries. We'll, uh, we'll get the team onto it. Okay. I um, fantastic. And uh, Great pleasure to be with you. There we go. Fantastic. And uh, secondly, uh, Felipe Bion, uh, the CEO of Ecopetrol Group, the largest oil and gas conglomerate in Colombia and one of the largest in Latin America. Uh, Mr. Bayon holds a degree in mechanical engineering from Universidad de los Andes and has over 20 years experience in the oil and gas industry. Uh, before assuming his role as CEO in 2007, Mr. Bayon served as Ecopetrol's chief operating officer, during which time he oversaw the upstream, midstream, downstream technology, engineering projects and marketing operations, as well as research innovation. So he knows the entire uh, life cycle of the industry. And prior to Eco Patrol, Mr. Bayon had a 20 year career at British Petroleum, BP, um, most recently serving as Senior Vice President of BP America and Head of the Deepwater Response Group. In 2019, just last year, he was actually nominated by peer executives and awarded the Executive of the Year, receiving the award on behalf of all of Eco Patrol's employees. Felipe, it's a pleasure to have you with us this morning, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, we can bring you up on screen here. Well, I, I can see myself on the video, Simon. It's, it's great to be here. I'm very excited. Thanks for the um, invitation. And Said, good to see you. Very, very honored to be here with you this morning. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you so much. I believe everything is working techno technology right now. Uh, uh, Felipe, it's really a great pleasure to be with you. I don't know if I mentioned to you before, but roughly between 20 to 25 years ago, I spent some time in Bogota in Colombia, visiting Bavaria, Postoban, Polaris, I believe, and Coca-Cola. That is in my a journey of uh, introducing the bottled water business, especially in the large eco container. And I must admit, you know, because at that time I was doing the same uh, five gallon bottled water business in Japan, in France, in, and some of the smartest people I have ever met were in Colombia you know, congratulations, you guys are both street smart and uh, I feel very witty uh, population. Do you agree with that assessment? Well, Said, thanks. And uh, I'm, I'm very glad that you've had some connections with uh, Colombia before. And I, I do believe that we have uh, very, very talented people. Uh, people are very hardworking. Uh, entrepreneurship, which is one of the things that you master, is one of the things that people want to do here. Uh, and that's why I think it's so important to, uh, for us to be able to provide some of the platforms that people can use to, to leverage and basically build on that. And I myself lived um, outside of Colombia for more than 13 years. I came back four years ago and I, I um, I'm always pleasantly surprised with the amount of talent and commitment uh, that people have in the countryside. Wonderful. You know, and, uh, you know, this series of discussion, which I had with, uh, like, Mayor of Houston, 
Mayor Park of Seoul, Korea, or the president of Shell Oil in uh, Germany. It's all about leadership through challenging times. And specifically, I think at Echo Patrol, uh, you have, you're dealing with multiple challenges at the same time. The COVID-19, the health of your employees, as well as the oil prices. How do you prioritize your day? How do you mobilize your team to go after these challenges? So I, I think, Saeed, the, the first thing that we need to acknowledge as leaders is that we ourselves, uh, we don't have all the answers for everything. So we, we rely on teams and networking and creating these ecosystems that will allow us to, uh, to do the right things at the right time. So we're, we're very disciplined as, a, as an industry. We've gone through different crises, you know, back in the 90s, in 08, 09, financial crisis, 15, 16, uh, related to our, our part of the business. But this one has been unprecedented. You know, it's something that, and you and I have chatted before, it, it touched everybody around the world. When you think that uh, more than half or half and a, four and a half billion people ha are in lockdown, Demand has been destroyed dramatically. The economies are suffering and we have a health and economic and eventually social crisis. So we need to rely on people. We need to rely on leadership. We need to let go and properly. The people that are accountable, accountable need to be delegated. We need to trust people, you know, and in that sense is ensuring that even if we don't have all the data, we need to make decisions. We need to act quickly. Uh, and especially because our first priority or top priority is uh, protecting the health and the life of our employees and working with those communities in which we operate. Uh, out of the 1,000 municipalities in Colombia, we're present in 330 of those. So we're very present. Uh, we go very deep into the communities. So I think it's a combination of that, you know, ensuring that we don't know everything, that we need to move quickly. Uh, and this, this is a very humbling experience. You know, it's, it's a time for solidarity and empathy. You know, and as uh, one of the leading companies, perhaps the largest company in Colombia, uh, everybody looks to you for leadership. You know, maybe even in other businesses, they look to you to have this stability, as well as I have read you're very proud of being transparent at the same time focus and uh, try to change with the challenges of today can you remember one of the examples of your being able to be open and transparent but at the same time make some decisions uh, quickly. Yes, absolutely, Said, And I, I think just very quick context. We have uh, 300,000 shareholders and the biggest shareholder is the, uh, the government. But we indirectly through the pension funds touch every day 16 million Colombians. That's a third of the population. Yeah. So, so we have a lot of skin in the game, you know, when, when we wake up and we need to do what we need to do every day. So one of the examples uh, that it's, it's, it's quite close to our, to our hearts is um, we had a, uh, a, one of our employees died of COVID-19 uh, back in April. We had to react very quickly and there were voices that said, you need to shut down refineries. You need to shut down everything. And if, have we done that, we would have basically stepped on the brakes for the country because we need to provide the gasoline, the gas, you know, the, for people to transport, for the ambulances, for the fire trucks, for, for the re real heroes to do what they need to do for food deliveries. But we, um, we did something, we, we called in for help and we used experts from the, um, the National Health Institute. They had a rapid deployment team. They went in, looked at our protocols, changed some of the things. 
They actually said, look, you're doing all the right things. And we communicated that very, very quickly using technology. We're far away dis physically, but technology has allowed us to communicate more quickly. So we use technology, we talk to our staff. We actually say, look, we understand you're apprehensive. There's, there's, uh, there's fear, there's worries. And even in less than four weeks, we, uh, we installed, and it's operational, uh, a biological molecular lab, and we're doing our, our own PCR testing for ourselves and for the community. So it's being transparent, communicating, saying, look, we need to, to learn quickly, act quickly, but being very open about how we're doing things. I, I mean, that is an incredible example. And uh, so far in uh, plug and play and our operations in Europe, we have had several cases but uh, thank God we haven't had, uh, you know, any death. But dealing with these challenge like you did, it's really what it takes, you know, because you cannot shut down the country. You cannot shut down the plant. I recall one of our top automotive partners, like we, know we have Mercedes, Porsche, but this company, Babesco, dealt with uh, COVID-19 as a first company in Germany. And, uh, you know, again, you have to always balance uh, the health and the well-being of people first. But I think this crisis has taught us to, as you said, work with the data, but you have to make a decision. You cannot wait and analyze it for a month or two. It will be too late. Yeah. And, uh, you know, talking about making decisions, can you tell me a little bit about your digital transformation? You mentioned, I don't know, I think you said 70% of your colleagues are now working remotely. Did you ever imagine this could be possible? And what could be the learning from this uh, experience? Well, Said, I think it's, it's a very good question, you know, and uh, I mean, very quickly, I would say, I would have not thought this was possible. You know, it seemed undoable. And uh, I, I, I use a phrase that obviously many people have used in history, but I said, look, at Ecopetrol, we need to make it possible what's impossible. You know, we need to move in that direction. And uh, uh, we've been investing in the digital transformation for the best part of two and a half years or three years. I mean, we've had systems all, the, all our lives, you know, and uh, some uh, specialized software for doing exploration and you name it, you know, or linear planning or programming the, um, the loads to the, uh, to the refineries. But over the last two and a half years, we've really invested in this. And I think it's the mindset that has changed. I was able to visit Plug and Play back in the fall last year, two, two times in two weeks with half and half of my management team. It was over 50 people. And it was not necessarily the technology or the software or the apps or whatever. It was the culture, you know? And one of the things that I brought back from Silicon Valley and from you guys was, you need to allow yourself to be able to fail quickly and react quickly and learn. And to your point, you don't have all the data. I think the other thing was around beliefs and behaviors. And that's one common thing I saw in Silicon Valley. So we brought that back. And I think the transformation has, uh, has helped us. For example, we did our first uh, AGM, something that has been done for long times. We had normally five or 6,000 shareholders in one venue, physically sitting in one venue. Well, this is back in the 27th of March, when there was limitations on the number of people that could gather, you know, it was a thousand, then 500, then a hundred, then nobody. So we did it all virtually. We had 8,000 connections and we had 135,000 people watching us on live TV. And I say, wow, you know, people would have said, well, the technology for voting, for the quorum, for everything, it worked. So when we push ourselves, I think we're able to unlock some of that potential change the paradigms and demonstrate that it's possible to do the impossible. Yeah, 
You know, in fact, you touched a very uh, interesting point. You know, I have some friends who help to build Google, you know, who help to build LinkedIn. And when I talk to them and I say, okay, the technology is important, uh, but they try to squeeze 20 years of business development, of serving their client into two years. And when you try to do that, you have to work uh, collaboratively, you have to work fast, you have to pivot if you're making a mistake. Like some people say, in Silicon Valley, you just try to eliminate as many mistakes as you can make because you're going so fast and you have to make so many decisions fast that you just try to navigate uh, the journey of entrepreneurship, innovation, and what we call open innovation. Yeah. You no, know, I know that as a large company in Colombia, you have uh, also social responsibility to help uh, provide energy to all the families. But also, are you helping the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Colombia? Because I have a very nice little company called Rappi that I invested in five years ago. And I love to find the next Rappi together. Can you tell us about how you are supporting the ecosystem? So absolutely, Said. So some of the things that we've, we've done, we're working with Impulsa, which is the agency in government that actually is helping all these efforts. And we've um, partnered with them in Se Emprende in Bogota. And we've actually have a physical space there so we can, I mean, it's not working right now as, as part of the COVID-19 response, but it can still work virtually, right? But we've launched something that it's a hundred times a hundred. So we've launched a hundred challenges for a hundred entrepreneurs in Colombia. And we've already um, uh, sort of defined uh, some of the uh, solutions to some of those uh, challenges. For example, how can we better account for our staff and people when we need to evacuate a facility? So the local talent has helped us develop those, uh, those uh, answers. So we're working on that. Or how do we deal with things around health, safety, and the environment? Well, how do we uh, deal with things like remotely monitoring uh, pipelines in the middle of the jungle in the, in the mountain ranges where we have uh, sometimes people stealing you know, the products from the pipeline? So all of that technology is being uh, developed. Or one of the other examples is with Ruta N in Medellin. Very, very proud of that because Medellin is a city that has ha suffered from uh, bad air quality for a very long time. So uh, two and a half years ago, we did a big push to improve and, uh, the quality of our uh, gasolines and diesels, you know, and reduce the amount of sulfur. But right now we've launched uh, with uh, yourselves, you know, and with Ruta N and we're, we're partnering and saying, What's the, the big solution or the next big thing in terms of air quality? We're looking at that. Or we're looking at things like fugitive emissions, you know, one of the deal flows that we're working with you guys. So it's saying, how can we leverage on your experience, for example, plug and play, the needs that we have, you know, in terms of our social responsibility, the investments, the environment, you know, reducing our carbon footprint, for example, or reducing emissions, but then ensuring that through that we can bring some of the entrepreneurs in country and raise that level and ensure there's opportunity and create that ecosystem site. Wonderful. You know, like you talked about challenges, you know, we work with Lloyd's Register, uh, one of the oldest companies in the world, 300 years plus, in uh, per challenging how we can make the shipping line safer? How can we make the ocean uh, exploration safer? And you'd be very, I mean, our audience would be very surprised 
that some technologies that work for IoT and mobility is very much transferable to safety. You know, in Colombia, we work with Claro, Aval, we work with Dabevela, and we feel the power of this platform is when you have large corporations, mm -hmm. sometimes even governments like Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Industry, universities, and entrepreneurs all collaborating together. It is really like magic when you see this collaborative and open innovation. And, you know, we've been able to do it uh, well in Sao Paulo. And we hope uh, with your help, with our other corporate partners in Colombia, we can support. I love your 100 for 100 challenges. I would love to challenge my colleague and our team and your team to support 100 startups per year out of Colombia. And, uh, you know, again, I, I want uh, to, like, I was very excited that you use blockchain to monitor the molecules. Yes. It's great. I mean, like, I, I, you know, I love your open mind and open attitude. And uh, can you tell me maybe one more, because when I had the board of director of Mercedes and their C-suite visit me, four years ago, they told me, Saeed, the electrification, the autonomous, and the connected car is moving so fast mm -hmm. that even with our 70,000 engineers, we cannot keep up. And that is why they are connecting with entrepreneurs to build new products and new technologies faster, better, cheaper. Do you feel we could do this in oil and gas industry and more specifically in uh, Colombia with you? And I know you're active in uh, US now, Brazil. What advice do you have for the entrepreneurs to how to work with EcoPatrol and your different uh, technology needs. So, so I think the the answers uh, definitely we we are part of that ecosystem. I think we have a, a very big responsibility. That's how we view ourselves. Uh, I'll give you very very quick examples. But two two years ago, we didn't have any bots helping us. And I remember the first one that we created was Betty. You know, it was created in house, and it helped employees get refunds for their schooling support for their families. Uh, and it worked very well. And I told this story at a leadership conference and I said, well, let me present Betty to you. We have over a hundred now working. So people see, wow, this is making my life better. This is, this is getting me to a better place. It's allowing me, it, it's giving me more time to think, which is great. Uh, but those, those developments are done with entrepreneurs. So there's an ecosystem where we go out of the company. We don't have all that expertise. So we pull in the resources and we work. So uh, people need to be um, sort of in the look or having their radar where we are in terms of, for example, the 100 times 100 challenge or some of the internal developments. And actually, I, I met an entrepreneur that came in to work with Ecopetro and I said, wow, you know, you're out there and you're doing your own thing. Why are you coming back? And I said, because you guys are leading on this. So I want to be part of that change. So the answer is yes. Your example of us tracking with blockchain the molecules from the wellhead to the port, it was something that some of our partners, technological partners, said, wow, that's never been done. Well, we're almost there in terms of rolling that out. So it's creating, I think, better working conditions for people. There is apprehension. People say, I'm going to lose my job, you know, and things like that. But I think we need to be more open. In that, in that space side. Yeah, you know, and in fact, I believe 
this power of having uh, entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs be closer to the conglomerates is win-win for everybody. Because the big corporations can see that small, nimble teams can build product and services fast, then the, you need the power of the big corporation to scale. So if you have good communication together, everybody wins. And uh, really, we at Plug and Play, we pride ourselves. Somebody explained to me like the big uh, Eco Patrol is like a tanker and a startup is like a speedboat. But you have to have them work on the same language, same platform. And that is uh, really when we find somebody uh, like you, Felipe, is a joy because you have the desire to take advantage of this uh, technology and innovations and implement it in a large scale. And it, it's not easy. Can you tell me like one of the challenges you faced when you wanted to work with entrepreneurs or startup? Because you know, I know that you're still owned but partially or majority by the government. You have some, you had some ministers on your board of directors. So it's kind of hard to do everything you want to do with some of the regulation. But can you tell me some of the challenges you have dealt with? So I think first inside, government has been very supportive of entrepreneurship, you know, and ensuring that Colombia can, can thrive in that space. As part of Colombia going into the OECD, some of the ministers that sat on the board are not on the board or in the board anymore. Uh, so corporate governance is very clear. And we are run uh, in that sense, uh, like an independent company, if you will. You know, obviously the, the government continues to be the biggest shareholder. But I think one of the biggest challenges is with culture. Because here we are, we need to protect what we've been doing for a very long time you know, which is produce oil and gas. And as we go forward, more and more and more gas, that it's environmentally more friendly. But I think that providing energy to people is one of the strongest ways to close the social gaps we have in the country. But as we're doing that, we're transitioning energy. So we're into renewables. We're going from, we're our biggest self-generating company of power in the country. So we have 5% installed capacity that is renewables. We're going to 20% by 2020. So we're installing solar farms in our operations. So people say, wow, you know, you're producing oil with solar energy. I said, absolutely. It reduces emissions and it's saving me money. It's great, great business. So challenges I think are largely uh, to do with the culture. It's back to this notion of being your beliefs, your behaviors, and ensuring that you can, you can feel safe when you fail and you need to recover. One last thing, Said, I, I was once told, hey, Mr. Bayon, do you acknowledge, or do you actually know that you're from the pre-internet era? It was not a compliment, you know? And I said, wow, you know, that means that I need to learn faster to be, to be in, in par with that speedboat that you were mentioning, or sometimes unlearn things so I can learn new things. I need to be open to that, and culture is fundamental. Yes, you know, I, I absolutely agree with you. And, you know, people, uh, especially by, you know, coincident, I came to Northern California 40 years ago, uh, going to Menlo College, which is like a small business school. Uh, and they told me this is like the back door to Stanford, but I never found a door. <laughs> but nevertheless, I was lucky enough to have an office on University Avenue. And if people tell me, Said, what is special about Silicon Valley? I think it's, of course, Stanford and Berkeley, but it's the culture of being open-minded and trying new things. Mm -hmm. 
like you mentioned, sometimes you have to forget about your old ways to be able to open new ways. And the culture of failure is okay, you know, and my recommendation to a lot of my corporate partner and now with offices in Paris, Germany, Stuttgart, Beijing, I said, you cannot duplicate what Silicon Valley is. You have to build your own ecosystem, but at the same time, you can be connected to Silicon Valley mm -hmm. for raising money, for scaling your business. And again, I think in the oil and gas business, similar to the automotive business, every industry is going through transformation at an incredible speed. Mm. And this COVID-19, if it had any positive thing, is that you can transform faster if you have to. <clears throat> and if I can also ask, uh, you know, was there any other learning you had and if it may even personal, you know, because still my wife loves me and I, we've been together now four months in the same house. And uh, that was a relearning how to live together uh, like 24 hours a day. Is there any other learning personal or business you could share with our audience? So, so I think, and I, I was mentioning earlier, I think this, uh, this moment in life is like a big test. And we've, uh, we've had to go back to basics, you know, what's important, what's relevant, what's the priority. And again, if I can, and, and responsibility is on me, if I take care of myself, I can allow others to do what they need to do, which is, uh, again, go and work the refineries and work the fields and all my respect and, and, and uh, support for them. Uh, but I think it's, it's that, uh, what you were mentioning, we're here in the house, you know, with the family, which is great. Uh, with all the traveling and, and uh, long days, uh, we had missed some of that and having just a conversation around the uh, dinner table, you know, it's something that we had lost and without everybody looking at their phones, you know, and, and just reconnecting, you know, and going back to the essentials. And I'll just mention, site my, my, uh, soon to be 16 year old daughter is sitting next to me. You know, she's here listening to the conversation and say, and that's something that I would have never imagined, you know, if I was back in the office or, so I, I think I'm very optimistic. I think uh, we still have a long ways to go in terms of going, uh, getting out of the crisis and recovering. Uh, but I think this, this can help us as an opportunity, you know, to, to make the best of us go out and, and help others, you know, and be more, uh, have more empathy and, and more solidarity as well. You're absolutely right. Before I bring back Simon to answer some of the audience question, I wanted to mention to you that year 2020 for plug and play and for me was the year of sustainability. We launched the Alliance to End Plastic Waste with the Alliance Group yeah. of the largest oil companies and petroleum companies in the world. And now, because of COVID-19, we are expanding both sustainability and environmental impact mm. with social impact. And again, for me, this, as you said, my daughter, Sophie, who is 21, inspired me that, Saeed, you have to use your connection, your entrepreneurs to make a better world. And I really, really hope uh, this COVID-19 keeps this social and environmental initiatives up front and focus for us. Agree, fully agree. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, Simon, would you like to join us and see if there is any questions from audience for Felipe? Absolutely, and thanks so much, gentlemen. There's been uh, 
with over 600 people on the line, we've had a whole slew of questions coming in. So um, to our audience, uh, we'll do our best to, uh, to get to, um, to most of them. Uh, so Philippe, the first one I thought was a, a really good one, which was uh, if one year ago you had a magic wand uh, that could tell the future, uh, a crystal ball that could tell the future, uh, what would you have done differently knowing everything that has uh, come our way um, with COVID? Yeah, I, I, thanks, Simon, and thanks for the question. I, I think that, uh, especially, um, you're never ready, uh, I think, or we were never ready to deal with uh, some of the emotional and psychological aspects of this. You know, just for context, more than 50% of the working people in Colombia don't have social security or health systems. So our employees are very fortunate in that sense. So we want to protect employment. But we've actually uh, have done a lot of work around psychological support and helping people. So it was mentioning four months with your wife is something that you need to get used to uh, again. So that, that's something that I, I think I would have uh, accelerated quite a bit. And the other big thing is um, we're all struggling with uh, remote work right now. A lot of the moms, for example, the women, they're telling us, look, I want, I want to be able to take care of my kids. I need to uh, prepare the, the lunch or food or whatever. I don't want to commute for two hours a day. I want to stay 100% remote. But do we have the ergonomics? Do we have the technology? We... So that's one of the things that I would, have, uh, I would have sort of pushed. You know, I had the opportunity of attending a conversation with Bill Gates. And he talked about a, a pandemic five years ago. And they asked him, so how do you feel right now? And he said, look, I, I should have been more vocal about it, you know, and pushy. Mm. And the worry is not pandemic number one, but what are we going to do when pandemic number two, three or four years down the road comes? So I, I think we need to seize this opportunity. And again, with the likes of your ecosystems, how can we do things, things better? That's great. And uh, there's actually a number of questions here around um, what you believe uh, will be things about... That, 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 that you've had to do by necessity um, due to the crisis that you think that you'll keep going forward? So I think remote working is one of them. I, I tell my, uh, my uh, execs, you know, and we now have a, a crisis uh, exec meeting every day with the exception of Sundays. And I, I asked them, so how many of you have used a printer in the last three months? No one. We're all using DocuSign or whatever, you know? The, the appropriate system for, for everybody here. But I said, get guys, whenever we go back to the offices and in the shape as, as we go back to the office, which we don't know yet, you won't find any printers because we don't need them anymore. So it's those things that very quick changes that we need to, uh, to do. But I think remote working is a big deal. Uh, we've been, I think, able to see that uh, we can work remotely. So I, I talked to my exploration guys. And they, they, for 30, 40 years, they had these big computers and massive computing capacity under their desk, each one, you know, and they needed to be like that with their equipment. They're all working from the cloud. So we're, we've mm -hmm. done this over the last 18 months. And uh, uh, savings, we've invested a little bit over 3 million bucks and we've already saved close to $8 billion, $8 million, not billion, M with a million in the first months of the year. So. It's doable, but we need to push ourselves. So I, I think remote working is a, is a big thing, you know, ensuring that we can work differently and we can be more efficient and we can still be safe, efficient, ethical, and transparent. Uh, that, that's, that's great. And I think that really dovetails into um, this other question around that. Uh, Said, you had a question. If I can add, uh, Felipe, to your point, you know, for the first two weeks of uh, shutdown, yeah. I was in shock and all. And we sort of delayed a couple of events because we do 600 events a year. I mean, that's like two a day. This is globally. Yeah. Then we clicked on and we said, let's do everything virtually. And we just that change of mind, like we talked about change of culture or change of mind. Now when, like I remember really well, we wanted to do a little event in Chicago. 
we had 22 different corporations online and it was so collaboratively i mean like we it was almost better than physical yeah so I think like what you said if we change our mind that it's possible to build a relationship get business done get quite frankly startups to work with big corporations like if i can also share with you we had a fiat chrysler deal flow that we had the tier one supplier yangfin also in the room with the startup so it was a startup technology that the oem wanted and the system the tier one supplier was going to implement it and you could do that but it would take 10 people to fly somewhere now yeah. we were able to do it uh, remotely and now we are promoting this multiple corporation and vcs looking at the same startup challenges at the same time i fully agree but fully it, agree. it can open a lot of new doors for us go ahead simon uh, we've got a really good question um, here around digital transformation. Philippe, you, you mentioned uh, you're making possible, making it possible to do the impossible. And uh, I think in a, a recent interview, you had spoken about um, having 600 transformation projects across the company and making transformation part of the DNA. And both of you were talking about culture. Um, so the question here is, uh, what practices have you put in place to stimulate this uh, innovative culture within Echo Patrol. Um, maybe there's processes that you put into place as well to support that. So, so one of the things that we did recently, we relaunched after more than five or seven years, our web page, our internet and everything else. So traditionally you would have taken, I don't know, 12 months to do that. So we brought our digital guys and, and a lot of uh, respect for Ernesto Gutierrez, our vice president for that area, who's brought that with him, you know, that mindset. So we brought the digital team with the comms guys and the, um, uh, and the guys who would normally do that. And it was done in weeks, three or four weeks. You know, it was agile, it was disruptive, it was open, it was different. So just being able to bring that method in and applying it differently, it's, it's good. So for example, traditionally, we, we need every month to close the accounts. And for that, we need to close the volumetrics how much production, how, how much sales, everything. That would take us two or three weeks and 150 people uh, having very long days and long nights. The last closing, we did it in three days, 150 people remotely. So it's, it's just, and again, saying, look, I don't know everything. I don't have all the answers. Let's bring somebody else. And, and in that, I think the, uh, yeah. and again, uh, my, my recognition and acknowledgement to the guys from the digital group that are pushing us constantly to look at things differently, you know, from technology point of view, but also from how we behave. There's actually a question here from, I, I believe one of Echo Patrol's uh, employees, they, uh, they said that basically the employees are uh, extremely excited about digital transformation. Um, how can we, the Echo Patrol, uh, Echo Patrol employees make it real and learn how to behave and uh, work with startups? So, and I'll use one example, you know, uh, we are uh, in oil and gas, we're like dinosaurs, you know, we're very, very um, antique or vintage. Some people would say <laughs> that sounds better, but uh, so I remember uh, when I, um, I was appointed CEO in 2017, everybody will co would come to their, uh, to our meetings in the mornings or Monday mornings with uh, folders and papers, you know, and clumsily bringing everything in. So I started showing up with uh, an iPad or a tablet. That's it, and it took a lot, you know, because no paper. Well, now everybody's using everything digitally. So everything's on the cloud. I use the systems, you know. I don't use paper anymore. And that was a big change. And now, two years later, people say, oh, well, that's how we work. Well, it wasn't three or four years ago. Mm. So back to uh, the employees first. Uh, I, want, I want people to be able to, uh, to allow for the change to happen. And don't worry, you know, you may be afraid, but open up and allow yourself to think differently and test things. 
and use the technology and use the apps. For example, we're now working with the government for a, um, an app that we can report on a daily basis any symptoms around COVID-19. And we can use that to see where people are and we can trace people, you know, and it's, it's been very, very positive. So we need to sort of let go, open up. Uh, we will fail sometimes, we will fail, but we need to fail quickly, you know, and we need to very quickly. Our business is a business of risk. Mm. Out of every 10 wells that we drill, in exploration, maybe three or four are successful. And that's a very, very high number. So we know how to deal with risk. We just need to think a bit differently. And great thing, you know, I, I, we, when we see the, the younger people in the office and everybody say, look, they're pushing us, you know, and we need to learn from them. Felipe, you mentioned yes. the dinosaurs. I cannot hold back. Can you <laughs> tell me what is behind the logo of Echo Patrol. I think it's a very colorful logo, but what is the meaning behind it? So it's an iguana, you know, as yes. I think you can see And I iguana. see it even in your bookshelf behind you. Yeah, there's a beautiful iguana in, in the back. And I, I, iguana is an animal that's typical from Colombia, some other countries as well, but it's part of that link that we have with the communities, with the nature, we want to do the things uh, in the right way. You know, I actually tell my people, uh, we're neighbors in those communities. Our people go and live there and shop there and their kids go to school. So uh, over like a decade ago, over a decade ago, there was a, an internal work and the, uh, the iguana was chosen because it was that message of, we can do things sustainably, we can protect what we have right now. We're, we're part of the backbone of the country in terms of uh, our royalties, our the taxes and providing uh, well-paid jobs and, and working with communities and investing in those communities. But we are also part of that transition into the future in terms of reducing our carbon footprint, reducing emissions, you know, uh, sustainability, the energy transition, you know, and for example, we, we have the Instituto Colombiano del Petróleo, which is the Colombian Petroleum Institute that eventually will change its name at some stage to the Instituto of Energy, you know, the Energy Institute. But we have the largest number of PhDs in country. And these guys are working with advanced materials, nanotechnology, lots of very, very cool things. And at some stage, side, we'll need to ensure that we can, we can create more linkage between them and, and, and you guys. But is part of that future, you know? We'll be here in different shape, 10, 15, 20 years, and, and we'll adapt, we'll adapt. Wonderful. Back to you, Simon. I, was, I thought you were gonna mention something about moving off uh, note-taking with a uh, pencil to an iPad, Said. <laughs> they still consider me very old-fashioned, you know? Um, look, we actually have a lot of, Pardon me, Felipe. Um, we actually have a lot of questions uh, coming in from uh, folks from other companies, startups, um, uh, industry, uh, academia around the uh, energy transition. And uh, perhaps you could talk a little bit um, about uh, which technologies you're seeing uh, are going to be the most important for enabling that tr transition. There's some. There are also some questions around jobs, you know, retraining, is it upskilling? What, um, yeah. And maybe you could talk just a little bit about Echo Patrol's point of view, your point of view on that. Okay, so energy transition, we want, I, I said earlier, we want to be gassier as a company, we want to produce more gas. So there's a lot of focus on that. So today, uh, more than 10 million households in Colombia use gas every day, which is brilliant but there's still 1.5 million families that use wood or coal every day. So we need to, to move in that direction. Uh, biofuels are important, renewables in terms of solar and wind, and uh, we've committed ourselves to install 300 megawatts of renewables for our own power generation by 2022. And you know, uh, very quickly, but this re renewable is solar plant that we installed 29% of the people that worked there were women. And a lot of them, it was the first time they ever worked. You know, and they would tell us, you know, I visited that plant many times and they said, look, now that we are working and even us, our husband, we actually know where the money is going. 
So how can we give some of that back to the communities in terms of retraining? So there's a lot of online opportunities right now. And uh, we actually have a, a Ecopetrol University. It's a virtual university. And we've, we've partnered with more than 32 universities. So we provide courses all year long, you know, and people can take them at their own speed. So the offers there, I think the, the important thing here, Simon, is that we need to acknowledge that our destiny needs to be on our hands. And what that means, we need to own our development and, and how we actually pursue opportunities as individuals, but then how we give back and we bring others with us. You know, Felipe, you pointed out education and retraining. You know, I think uh, what we have learned of working remotely, if we add layer of retraining and education on top of it, I think it can be incredible, yeah. powerful during this uh, digital transformation. And they are, they are right, Simon is right. I still, even though I'm very digital, I still like paper. So they all make fun of me, you know? But I just make notes to myself. <laughs> I'm, I'm like you, I still make notes, don't worry. Okay. Well, and you also have a, a memory like no one else. And I think uh, there's actually some research that supports writing things down for, for remembering. So it's not all, you know, no, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, uh, Philippe, I think we're, we're nearly um, up, up to our time, but we have um, a bunch of questions. Uh, say, here's one from uh, uh, Manuel, and he said, look, he's a bachelor's um, in geology. He's been thinking about roles of uh, geoscientists um, in the oil and gas in the f industry in the future. There's been some startups talking about, look, we're, we're interested in blockchain, crypto, um, crypto technologies. Um, how, how do people think about getting involved in the innovation ecosystem with Echo Patrol? Um, is, is there a, an intake? How, how are you thinking about processes and engaging with entrepreneurs, new scientists, these kinds of things? So I, I think one of the things that I mentioned, which is the 100 times 100, you know, the 100 challenges for 100 entrepreneurs. So uh, I'd ask people, look, uh, be on the, on the look for things or have on your radar Echo Petrol on our webpage, you know, there's, there's people that you can contact there. You can write to us, you can write directly to me, you know, and I'll directly direct you to the right people, you know. Uh, my, uh, my email is felipe.bayon at ecopetrol.com.co, you know, and again, we need to be open. And a lot of the things is wow. open code and open source, and we'll continue to do that. And actually, one of the things that uh, I think is important, we want to learn from you guys as well. You know, how you guys as entrepreneurs, I'm talking to the broader audience, you see things, you know, how should we approach things differently? We need to learn as well, you know, from, from others. That's great. Said, we have what time for just one more, so over to you. No, thank you so much, uh, Felipe. It is great getting to know you better uh, during this fireside chat and Generally, like I say, if you had one or two messages for the audience, more than ever, I say it's time for entrepreneurs yeah. to build their dream company. That is sort of like my message. What would be your message to the audience? So, Saeed, and thanks again for the opportunity. I, I could have stayed here all day long. You know, I have a board meeting later on, but I could have stay here, prefer to stay here, uh, enjoyed very much the conversation. And I think we're going to an unprecedented crisis. It's gonna to be tough, it's gonna to last longer, uh, but I think it's time not only for entrepreneurship, but also for a lot of empathy, humanity, uh, solidarity. Uh, and I think we'll, we'll recover, you know, we need to be stronger. Uh, we need to be humble, but I'll ask people, look, uh, follow your dreams, don't give up. If you fail, fail quickly, you know, but there's a lot of opportunity and the, the, the world, everybody in the world, we will all need all the good energy and, uh, and commitment and hard work from people like the people in this call today to make sure that, uh, that we can bring the world back to even a better place from where we were some months ago. 
I really appreciate that, Felipe. Thank you so much. And uh, looking forward to seeing you soon in Colombia or in California. Thank you. Thanks, Saeed. Have a great one. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, everyone. Beautiful.